Hey, good morning, Grace. Uh, good morning on this Saturday morning. Uh, it's a nice, cool day out. It's going to be a beautiful day. Coming to you a little bit early this morning. I need to get out and about and get some things done, so I'm, I'm broadcasting 30 minutes early. I'm sure you can watch it on replay. Uh, hopefully you're sleeping in right now. Uh, I was thankful yesterday for Sam's uh, opening uh, presentation of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he did an excellent job of, of presenting to us the backdrop of the Sermon on the Mount. That was an excellent job. Sam, thank you for giving us that context. Uh, normally Jason would be here right now. He has prior commitments, so I'm filling in for him. He'll be with us next week as we continue to go through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this morning, though, we want to look at uh, Matthew 5, 4. Uh, just one verse as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. So let me pray and ask God to give us understanding of this verse. Father, we thank you for this gorgeous day that you're giving us now. Thank you that um, there is joy in the morning, uh, that your mercies are new every morning. Uh, Father, we pray that today that we would grow in our love for you, our love for your word, our love for others, uh, that you would be glorified in us. Help us to have understanding now in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start with an illustration as we look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. And that verse simply says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Uh, a few years back, I, was, uh, I had the privilege of going to Israel. That was a tremendous blessing to myself and my wife. And towards the end of the trip, um, the schedule changed and there was a slot that was open. And they gave us some options, and our group chose to go to the Holocaust Museum uh, there in Jerusalem. And what a life-changing uh, trip that was to that museum. Well, uh, you know, you walk through this long corridor, and there's displays on either side. There's uh, areas where you can see different aspects of the Holocaust. Uh, just a very quiet and somber experience as you walk through there. Um, but in one room, we walked into the room and the floor was made of uh, really thick plexiglass. You could see right through the floor. And under the floor, there were just hundreds of shoes. There were just shoes everywhere. As we walked over those shoes, I just, I personally became overwhelmed because those shoes represented lives of people uh, that were taken away, that were destroyed because of sin. Uh, there were shoes of little children. There were shoes of, you know, women, high heel shoes. There were men's work shoes. And each pair of shoes represented uh, a life creating the image of God that had been destroyed by sin. And so, uh, you know, the, the takeaway for me was what a devastating, devastating portrayal of, of sin. And so Jesus today is telling us um, that we need to mourn over sin. Uh, that sin is not the way God designed things to be. Sin is, is something that we brought into the world. What is your response to sin? I mean, what is your response when you hear about children who are, who are uh, abused by the parents that are supposed to love them? What is your response when you hear of a young mother of three children who's been diagnosed with stage four um, breast cancer? What is your response when you visit a nursing home and you walk into a room and there? Uh, in the bed, lying in the bed, is a person who can't even roll over. They can't even swallow. What is your response um, when you come across a person on the street whose life is just racked by the effects of, of alcohol and drugs? These are all examples of suffering caused by sin. And really, Jesus' point here, when he says, Blessed are those who mourn, the mourning he's referring to is mourning over sin, the devastating effects of sin on the rest of God's creation. And I believe it's important that we mourn over sin because it is devastating. It's not how God, the creating of creator of the universe, the loving creator designed things to be. I think we need to mourn when we see racism. We need to mourn when we see division in society, when we see hatred in society. I think we need to mourn when we see marriages and other close relationships destroyed by sin. I think we need to mourn when we see terminal illness that produces a slow and painful death. That should be mournful. We should mourn when we see people self-destruct, as I've mentioned, through bad behaviors. We should mourn anytime we see a human being, one created the image of God, dying. Uh, we should mourn because sin constantly is seeking to destroy the beauty of this world. 
as it daily eats away at the image of God, at the image of God and humanity. I think we need to mourn because sin is an affront to a holy and beautiful God who lovingly gives us all that is good. We need to mourn because sin separates mankind, humanity from God, and it seeks to to place humanity in that separated condition for all of eternity. We need to mourn because sin sin nailed the beautiful, sin, sinless loving, compassionate, merciful Son of God to the cross, bringing an end to his life. Sin destroys. Sin devastates. We need to mourn over sin. We need to mourn over our own personal sin. As Jesus spoke the words, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He had in mind the the great comfort and relief for all those who would enter the kingdom, who would no longer experience the devastation produced by sin. Right As we look at um, the Sermon on the Mount, we're looking at what life will be like in the kingdom. Now, there's an aspect of that that we'll have now uh, in this life, but but really Jesus is looking forward to that time. What will characterize those who've experienced the new birth, those who are in the kingdom? And, and those who are in the kingdom will no longer mourn over sin. They will be comforted by their great King, Jesus Christ. The, the comfort that Jesus is speaking of here really harkens back to God's relationship to his people uh, as we look at um, the nation of Israel and how they rebelled against God, how they continue to introduce the devastating effects of sin into their life. And Isaiah really is, is the prophetic book that helps us best to understand the coming kingdom of God, really the, the need for the kingdom, the one who would usher in the kingdom, and then what life will be like in the kingdom. In, in Isaiah chapter 9, well, really at the beginning of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, uh, Isaiah introduces the problem uh, that, inter- that, that, that causes suffering in this world, that causes mourning in this world. He talks about the sin of Israel. Um, and, and then he begins to talk about God's judgment on sin. But he talks about the great hope of the coming Messiah. But that darkness caused by sin is mentioned to us in Isaiah chapter 9. He says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Right, That darkness is the darkness of sin. It's the darkness that's produced by uh, rejection of the revelation of God to his people. And so Isaiah, he says, look, there is darkness now, but a light is coming. The problem is darkness. The problem is sin. The problem is rejection of God's word. And God's, the Father's solution to the devastating darkness of sin was to send a servant of light, the great servant Jesus Christ, who would serve us best by dispelling the darkness of lies dispersed by the devil, by lighting the world with the truth of God and salvation from the darkness of sin. The Father's solution was to send Jesus Christ, the servant, who would take away the devastating effects of sin, who would bring comfort to those who are mourning. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, about two-thirds away, two-thirds through the book of Isaiah, God says this as he introduces this servant of light who would destroy the devastating effects of sin. He says this, he says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Comfort is coming to those who are mourning over their sin. The servant The great servant, Jesus Christ, is the one who would destroy the darkness of sin. And from Isaiah 40 forward all the way to Isaiah 53, Isaiah is going through a discussion of this this one who would destroy mourning in the world. David talks about this in the Psalms. I'm not sure if it's David. The psalmist talks about this in Psalm 30. He says, Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth. You removed my mourning and crowned me with joy. The book of Isaiah ends by discussing uh, the mourning that will end all mourning. That day that will dawn when the Savior of the world will return. And he will set up his kingdom. And again, I think it's important as we look at the Sermon on the Mount... And especially, we need to consider Isaiah 61, uh, those prophetic passages in Isaiah that talk about the kingdom, uh, talk about 
uh, what life will be like in this in the kingdom uh, really are going to help us as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. But Isaiah 61 is so key. And Isaiah 61 is the passage that Jesus read from the scroll in the synagogue when he's beginning his messianic ministry, when he was beginning his message of proclaiming repentance for the kingdom of God is near. In Isaiah 61, Jesus read these words. He says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness, a release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, which is Jerusalem, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for his display and splendor, right? As Jesus, uh, as Isaiah presents the Messiah, Jesus, who will usher in the kingdom, he talks about uh, this joy that will come, this relief from the mourning over the devastation of sin as the Savior introduces the kingdom, as he sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. So when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, the comfort he is referring to is the comfort in the kingdom when he returns. It's a future comfort, a comfort for those who through the new birth will enter into his kingdom. So if you're looking for a time where there will be no mourning, there'll be no sorrow and sadness and brokenness over sin, you need to enter into the kingdom of God. And that's only possible through the new birth. The new birth is possible as you place your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as you recognize the devastation of, in your life because of sin, that you've rejected God, and that you embrace Jesus Christ, the one who died, taking your sin upon himself, rising from the dead on the third day, to give us the hope of a life without, without any mourning, without any devastating effects of sin. So as we consider this future kingdom, what about right now, right? Because we're living in the now. Right now, we experience a partial comfort knowing the surety of the coming of the kingdom where there will be no mourning, right? We, we have a future hope, a future faith, knowing that there is a time coming. Because as we look out at the world now, it's devastating to see the effects of sin on the world. And we want something different. We want it to be the way God designed it to be. Right now, we should mourn over our own sinfulness, that same sinfulness that destroys all that is beautiful. We should mourn over sin in our own lives. Right now, we should mourn over our spiritual poverty, but rejoice in the rich righteousness that Jesus offers through the new birth. Right now, we can have joy knowing that our suffering because of the devastating effects of sin is only temporary. Right now, we should be motivated to communicate the death-defying, comfort-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. We should long for others to be in the kingdom with us. We should long for others to experience that joy that comes in the morning of the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Right now, we should long for the return of Jesus Christ. We should long for his kingdom. We should long for comfort that only the King, Jesus Christ, should give or can give. So this morning, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What a beautiful truth in the word of God. What great hope for a future where there will be no more sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this great hope given to us in your word, that though we suffer and we mourn over sin now, a day is coming when we will be comforted by our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, please help us to live in light of that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, I will see you on Monday morning. And we're going to talk about meekness. Uh, have a great day of worship tomorrow. Looking forward to hearing Jason. He's going to preach it tomorrow morning. Uh, so either come to Grace or tune in, live stream, and listen to Jason uh, present the Word of God. Love you guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.